Good evening, welcome. Tanse Duzu Anin Wado. Welcome to Decolonize Beats. With that treaty one, where our heart of the turtle meets, the two rivers where our relatives met. So across the medicine line, I have my girlfriend Jan Deer in water from Prussian colonialism and decolonized meats with me. This is her second time to our territory. The first time was in the winter to go visit Camp Morgan. And Jen and I want to welcome you all back into community and Thunderbird House. You are all are welcome, no matter where you walk. So we are grateful for you to be here. So to start off, we're just going to do some housekeeping. Woman's bathroom, men's bathroom to my right. Exit to the north. to the south. You read what you go without. Because that's too much, because these are community members and, and, and I would say so much more, but you all know what you need to do in this, in this community and, and she's just going to read off some stuff because she wrote it. <laughs> well, see y'all. I'm Jen. I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. I was raised on my nation's reservation in rural areas of Tolson County and lived in Abilene, Texas for a bit. I now call Piscataway Way Land Home, which is known as Washington, D.C. And I am so thankful and honored to be here with you all. Um, I just want to make a couple of disability access announcements. The first being for myself. I have put my cane down somewhere and cannot find it. So if you see a blue cane, please bring it to me. <laughs> um, so going on from there, Crushing Colonialism is dedicated to the full inclusion of our deaf, disabled, ill, and neurodivergent relatives and friends. And disability justice is a cornerstone of our work. And so over here we have Shannon and Kevin. They are our sign language interpreters tonight. Um, they are from ECCOE. And for those who may be viewing this event online because we are live streaming it, we want you to know that this is a live interpretation from English to ASL and not a group recorded edited translation. Um, when we put out all the food later, we'll have dietary and allergen friendly foods. Um, so just try not to cross-contaminate and keep the, the spoons and the, the serving utensils with each item. Um, yeah, I guess you all already know this. Oh, we have over here the yellow room is where we are putting children. There's crayons and coloring books and things. And then where would we do quiet space? Quiet space is right here. Our lovely community member Chelsea. Chelsea's waving her hand over here to my left. She's got medicines if you need a quiet space, if you need someone to sit down and speak with in regards to some emotional or well being care. And as we move on, um, we do have raffle as you walked in. You did see that we do have t shirts and uh, raffle tickets. Uh, again, uh, the items are at the back. You can take a peek. Uh, again, some of the proceeds will be going towards Camp Morgan and Camp Mercedes to purchase items off their wish list so that they can do the work that they're doing out in the field, on the lands, and um, at the Human Rights Museum now. We have Camp Mercedes with the family there on the ground and they need support. And that's why we're doing this much raising effort for those that are on the ground. Um, I also want to share uh, what else we got here. Raffle donations and things. Yeah. All right. Well, quickly, um, most of the items that are back there um, um, were donated anonymously, but we do have a few that would, uh, we'd like to share with you. So first and foremost, there is that self-care basket with all the soap, and that is from all our farms an organic farm just south of the city. And they also have a new uh, initiative right here 
um, behind MMS, which is also called uh, Inner City Aurora Farm. So that's a new initiative coming up. They're already growing some uh, some herbs and uh, um, community members get involved. So we have uh, our relatives that we meet them where they're at and, and they, you know, they ask us what we're doing. So we go in and just share that information and they just want to engage. So they get invited back and they have a skill and participate with us. Uh, we also have a gift certificate in U.S. funds, electronic gift certificate from Cheap Boom Beauty. It is with the necklace that was donated, very beautiful blue necklace at the back and the auction items, or, or what is it? raffle items, sorry. We also have um, the beautiful copper uh, traditional beaded earrings from Cherokee Images. They're the ones that are the smaller ones here. Short and dangly on the back there, up on the bundle. I can't remember which one I put it in. Oh, it's with the poster of the Godzilla fight at the pipeline down south in Texas, which is an art piece that was donated for my girlfriend Sasha. Um, and then we can go on to. Um, you can do the next slide. Yeah. I didn't get. To, 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 to. Okay, so the next item is actually uh, a, it's one that I signed. So it's a signed copy of Crip Authorship, Disability as Method. Um, I have a piece in there. The book just came out last month, so that is included in the basket uh, with all of the tea items, which was donated by Healing Vibes and Accessories. We also have a copy of Indigenous Resistance, Seeking Wholeness Every Day. That book is by Caitlin B. Curtis. She was actually one of our very first board members at Crushing Colonialism. Um, let's see, we also have a basket of skincare and tea items that was donated by Roxy Fault. Um, and we have a beautiful beaded kind of like a little purse up there that is from uh, Travis Barcy and Rain donated things. And we also, as Henry mentioned, had items donated uh, by anonymous people. And so we just want to say wado, miigwech, all the thank yous to everyone who donated. We will be pulling the raffle tickets at the end of the night. You must be here and you must have your ticket in order to get your prize. And I guess next up we'll be opening with Charlotte Nolan. Um, so Charlotte, uh, Stand Strong Eagle Woman, is a 72-year-old two-spirit meeting woman who grew up immersed in the infamous 60s scoop. Taken at six months of age, she grew up in various foster homes and one group home. From 1958 to 1963, Charlotte attended the Indian Day School for Roseau River Reserve. I apologize if I did not say that correctly. There she learned firsthand that Indigenous children were regarded as less than human. When Charlotte left the child welfare system, she entered the justice system. Charlotte attempted to live as her true self when she was younger, only to realize that Canada was a racist, homophobic, and transphobic country. Charlotte returned to the closet, got married, and raised seven children and numerous nephews and nieces. Today, Charlotte lives as her authentic self and devotes her life to teaching young 2S LGBTQQIA plus individuals our traditions, culture, and ceremonies. Today, Charlotte works with the University of Manitoba, the federal government, and shares history with her relatives. So, Charlotte, please come up. That said, bonjour. Hi, Mister. I always got strong. Keep your head square. There, go. I can show you the team and bring you that. There, go. Charles. Keep your head on them. Red River Settlement, Dochen, Tastawiniel, Tipimiswa. Greetings, my relatives. I introduce myself by the names that I walk with, which are Stand Strong Eagle Woman, Red Horse Running, and Charlotte. 
also mentioned that I'm from the Eagle Clan, and I was born in a Red River settlement, which is now Winnipeg. My ancestors came here in 1803 to Manitoba, and took part in many things. The first two teachers out here were my great aunts, Andre Lick and Margaret Nolan. It's an honor for me to be here with you, to welcome you in a good way, and to open this event up in our traditional ways, by opening up with a prayer, and asking Creator, the old ones to come and sit with us, come and guide us in the words that we're going to share with one another. I don't know if that would like to say many too. Can I ask them, Tim? Can I ask him, Tim, cook now, must now? Can I ask him, Tim? Me, we, my gun, I swear, can we catch one? Yeah, quack, a snake was promised us. Yeah, quack, wapis, people, it's quack. Yeah, quack. Yep, can Tim, must quack. Can I ask him, Tim? Can you now ask me? Creator, grandmothers, grandfathers, I humbly stand here today and ask for your blessings on my relatives. I ask you to take care of them, the ones that are in the camps. Take care of our relatives who we haven't brought home yet. I ask you to be with all of my relatives from the four sacred directions and to help them understand the very true nature of what we are, who we are. First and foremost, before the names that I walk with, I'm a human being, the same as all of you, the same as all of humanity. We are human beings. And we ask Creator, Kokumau, Mosumau, to help us in our journeys to help us in the words that we share with one another. I ask the greater grandmothers, grandfathers, to bring home all the little ones that we lost in the residential schools. As was mentioned, that's all part of my family. My two older brothers were in residential school. Me and one of my sisters were in the Indian Day School at Rozo. And I spent 19 years as a ward of the government. The one thing that I learned in my 72 years is I learned to forgive myself because I wasn't responsible for what happened. And I learned to forgive all those that harmed me harmed my family members. And so, Creator, grandmothers, grandfathers, I ask you to be with my relatives here tonight. Enter their heart, their spirit. Let the words that we need to share with one another be gentle, be filled with love, and be filled with respect. If I've forgotten anything, Creator, Please accept them in my sound prayers. Mitakwe ase, yagin altumak anak, tut mapaghate, all my relations. Yagin kase. Kase, yigwadish. And um, I'm honest. I'm 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 one of them. I'm so honest. I found my voice and. I'm, I'm, I don't have bifocals, and it's really hard for me to read what they've written down. But um, up next, and uh, our walk here in our territories with our community members, I'd like to introduce Kind Heart Woman Singers, a family group who sing prayer songs, social songs from the ceremonies they attended growing up and continue to do within our community. Kind Heart Woman Singers, Mostly sing social and ceremonial songs in Lakota and in Anishinaabe. The singers include Raven Hart, Dee, 
Hart, Avano Yellowback, Caitlin Hart, and Skyla Hart. And I'd like to introduce to them to you now. First and foremost, part of my teachings again, when we ask our relatives for to give of themselves to share their gifts with us, uh, we pass that sima first and foremost, that first medicine that that Creator gave to us to share, to learn and grow with. So I honor this sima and this opportunity to have my relatives here, some I've met, those I've walked with for many years, and those I continue to walk. We just want to acknowledge all of our relatives that are here, as well as our relatives at Camp Morgan, and we just want to acknowledge this beautiful drum group and our beautiful Elder Charlotte for that prayer and the beautiful kind words. I'm going to sing a beautiful prayer song with my family. <laughs>
I'm not going to sing on my flag music, it's just quite loud. Um, be sorry. We have gifts. We have gifts. So, and, and could you share a little bit more about what that song was about and where that originated from for, for our relatives that are not from our territories or might not know? Awesome. Um, Beijing, Tansy relatives. Um, the song that we chose to sing today is a prayer song. And it comes from our creation stories. And it tells us how much creator loves us. And it, it, it's a story about um, a young person who uh, was leaving the spirit world to come down to Mother Earth. And creator had let this young person know that I created a really beautiful place for you. And I need you to go there. And this young person cried to creator and said, I don't want to leave you. It's beautiful here. I want to be here with you. I feel so loved and happy. And Creator said, I love you so much that I created this beautiful place. And it took that young person four times to turn around from Creator before Creator helped lower that young person down to Mother Earth here. And so that song reminds us how loved we are by creation when we forget when things get hard, when life gets hard. How, how loved we are by creation, and to remember that we have relatives outside of human relations, that there's plants and animals, that the star nations and all the stars love us just as much, that grandmother moon, all of our relations, and that whenever we have a hard time, all we have to do is put our feet down to Mother Earth and ask her to take care of us. And when 
Our love can't reach our loved ones, wherever they are. All we have to do is ask Mother Earth to take care of them. So miigwech, miigwese, hi, hi. So again, I just want to share with everybody, this is what community is about, coming together as community in Thunderbird House, what it was meant for, you know, to share that knowledge, to share those songs, to share who we are, that loving, kind, generous people. So uh, as we move forward in our agenda, we are now going to move into a show film, and I'm going to hand the mic over to Jen. And she's going to introduce the film. It is one of our relatives, actually, um, from a different territory. But I want to introduce, so here's Jen. So tonight is our first ever international event, and I can't be more thrilled that we're hosting it here in Treaty One territory. So I was asked a few times, you know, why, why Winnipeg? You know, you're a U.S.-based org, you're in Washington, D.C. Um, why Winnipeg? And, you know, I was here, as Lorraine said earlier, uh, in February and March. And honestly, I, I really love it here. Um, you know, since leaving my reservation in Oklahoma, it's been rare for me to see Indigenous people in daily life. We're so erased in the so-called U.S., especially in Washington, D.C., that unless it's specifically a native event or space, I don't see us. Over the last 20 plus years of living in urban areas, I've almost always been the only native of the room. For many years, I was also the only out bisexual or queer person, and I'm still often the only openly disabled person in the room. So when uh, AC Agoyo over here, our master of all things tech and AV, and our press liaison, the secretary of our board, and the co-founder and editor-chief of Indians.com. <laughs> um, so when AC suggested that we bold an event here, you know, I said, absolutely, it happens to coincide with the Indigenous Journalists Association's annual conference. They are a U.S.-based organization supporting Native journalists. Um, and, you know, it just, it seemed serendipitous. It was the ideal time to do this. You know, and I responded that if community wants us, then we'll go to Winnipeg. You know, and things are different here in Winnipeg versus D.C. or much of the U.S. I see our relatives everywhere here. I literally cried tears of joy on my last visit, just seeing Indigenous people waiting for the bus or at the grocery store and crying in your cold winter weather was not pleasant out on the street. <laughs> uh, for one of the first times in my life, I didn't feel so erased or alone. But while visibility is important, it will never be enough. We have so many similar problems in this so-called U.S., like our children being stolen through courts and family services or our murdered and missing relatives. A 14-year-old was recently discovered on the Camp Pendleton Marine Base in California. She was sold to a Marine and held on the base for two weeks. Her family says the military is trying to cover up this atrocity. And that doesn't feel much different to me than the Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Canadian governments refusing to search the landfills. What is the point of a national inquiry on murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls if the government won't implement the calls to justice. While I was here last time, I was able to meet Cambria Harris and visit Camp Morgan. I later interviewed Cambria and wrote a piece with Truth Out about her story and that of the other relatives who are believed to be in the landfills. So my heart aches for the families and communities, but more than anything, I'm enraged. I'm enraged that this genocide is still happening and the police are too busy playing their games. To, and, and harassing indigenous people who just want to bring their loved ones home. They're too busy doing that rather than searching for your missing relatives. You know, anywhere, excuse me, I'm enraged that I see this violence across lands and borders and oceans. Anywhere the white man has invaded, indigenous people are suffering. 
from indigenous children being locked in adult prisons in so-called Australia, to the Sami fighting deforestation in the Nordic regions, or our Maasai relatives fighting to keep their remaining lands from being stolen by the Kenyan government. Our relatives are suffering, but they're also fighting back. You know, I'm enraged that our two-spirit LGBTQIA plus relatives, especially in the so-called U.S. right now, are fighting for our very survival as queer indigenous people, both within and outside our native communities and our tribes. I'm just angry. I want change, and I want it now, and I want it under decolonial indigenous leadership. But I know we need joy, too. And that's part of what Decolonized Beats is about. It's about creating a space to center our voices, needs, anger, beauty, and joy. It's about giving all of our storytellers, whether they're artists, filmmakers, or community members speaking their truth, a safe, disability-accessible, welcoming space to do so. It's about giving our non-Native neighbors and friends a space to learn from us under our guidance and direction as we so choose. It's also about recognizing that despite all of our traumas and pain, we are still here and we are fighting back. Just like our ancestors did, we will fight back. And I am just so honored and humbled to be welcome here, uh, to have all of you here in this room with us, the people watching, all of Cedar's guidance and support. You know, I just feel very thankful to be here with you all. And so with that, I'm going to tell you about our film and Theo. So we have a film up called Extractions. It's by Theo Jean Cuthand. So Theo was born in Regina, or excuse me, Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada in 1978 and grew up in Saskatoon. Since 1995, he's been making short experimental videos and films about sexuality, madness, queer identity and love, and gender and, and, and indigeneity, which have screened in festivals internationally. His work has also exhibited at art galleries, including the MoMA in New York City, the National Gallery in Ottawa, and the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. He completed his BFA major in film and video at Emily Carr University of Art and Design in 2005, and his Master's of Arts in Media Production at Ryerson University in 2015. He has also written three feature screenplays and has performed at Live at the End of the Century in Vancouver, Queer City Cinema's Performatorium in Regina, and a 7A Asterisk LLD in Toronto. In 2017, he won the Hanachin Foundation to Reveal Indigenous Art Award. He's a Whitney Biannual Artist from 2019, and he is of Plains Tree and Scots descent, a member of Little Pine First Nation, and currently resides in Toronto, Canada. So with that, we're going to launch the film, and then we have a short Q&A uh, between Theo and myself following the film. So enjoy. Someone asked me recently if there's any type of funding I wouldn't accept to make art, and I said resource extraction money. But then while I was laying in bed last night, I realized I already had. I'd gotten a scholarship in my undergrad from an organization funded by resource extraction companies. And my reserve got some land a while back that had oil reserves on it. So they've been giving out bonuses at Christmas based sometimes on oil dividends. Other times they give us payments from selling our gravel, the stuff that the nearby Hutterites sometimes come to steal. The irony of selling our own land back to white municipalities is kind of too much to think about. I am against resource extraction and the culture of anti-indigenous misogyny that goes with it in regards to man camps and rapist murdering security companies here and abroad. I don't think we are really needing more gold or oil or diamonds or lumber. I like to think there are alternatives. I like to think we already have enough and just need to distribute it better or something. I don't really have solutions, but I know we lived on this land for many thousands of years before colonization and seem to be doing well with it before industrialization happened. 
I feel like our systems of management were good and beneficial for everyone who lived here, even the animals, especially the animals. I feel like I want to know more about what life was like before this apocalypse happened here. I feel sometimes hopeful that maybe everything will collapse and we will go back to these old ways of being, like my blood memory will remember how to survive in tough times. When I lived in one of the roughest, most racist, most homophobic and transphobic redneck towns in BC, Merritt, there was a large logging industry that kept the town going. There's really only snapshots I have of that place. Only brief memories, like how the boys in junior high kept cans and cans of chewing tobacco in their lockers, like painting this stupid mascot on the gym wall because they found out I liked art, like climbing the mountain on weekends for something to do, like this huge thing that burned in the night The huge thing was metal, like a cone. They called it a beehive burner, and it was filled with waste wood like chips and sawdust and small pieces they had no use for. And at least once a week when it was full, they would burn it all. It would glow red in the night like the most malevolent force, like something in a Disney cartoon that signifies death and magic. All right. So how did you get into filmmaking? Yeah. So um, I got into it when I was 16 years old. Uh, I was um, in a in a workshop that was part of like a queer film festival that was in Saskatoon um, in 95. And it was just for that one year. They never did that festival again. Um, but yeah, they had Maureen Bradley come out and she taught sort of like um, video art practices and so we made a video for that weekend and um that was called lessons in baby dyke theory and it was about trying to find other lesbians because at the time i was ad identifying as a lesbian and was for like quite a long time but um yeah and like trying to find other queers in high school and not being able to find them and it was kind of this short cute video i think it was like three and a half minutes maybe five minutes um and it kind of like in the in the mid nineties, there wasn't a lot of work being done by queer youth in the video art world. So I mean, except for Sadie Denning, which they all compared me to. But um, but yeah, so it like it traveled to like all these queer film festivals internationally, and then and then yeah, that was kind of just um confirmation to keep doing it because people were watching. So yeah. So extractions covers a lot of topics, um, in a very intersectional way, especially for a shorter film. You know, and many people, even those maybe working on some of those issues, may not think of the connections of art, gender, sexuality, war, child protective services, mental health, resource extraction. Um, but you do such an incredible job showing these connections. What would you like to see the art and film industry, as well as movements that are working on these problems, do to address the intersectional nature of these issues? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think probably like for me, the most pressing thing right now is climate change. So if there's more film companies that were like dedicated to sort of like reducing sort of like fossil fuel use and, you know, things like that. And also, you know, like giving back to communities that they're like shooting in, um, like, um, I guess, I guess like, like we're working on like a feature film right now. And like part of our strategy is to hire local indigenous people to sort of like apprentice, like as crew members and stuff. Um, I think also just like being aware of what it politically means to be in Canada and like, um, sort of the things Canada's involved with in terms of like resource extraction and, um, the child welfare industry and, um, yeah, I think, I, I don't know. It's a hard question, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a big question uh, to try to answer, especially in a, in a Q&A. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but, you know, really like sort of addressing that, you know, the use of, you know, resource extractive industries and, you know, in art and creative practices, you know, so many of them fund museums and film festivals and all sorts of creative practices 
And uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that, like how much like dirty money, it, not that money is not dirty in general, but is involved in the arts, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I had this issue when I was um, in the Whitney Biennial, which I made another video that's like part of this trilogy called Less Lethal Fetishes. And um, what happened was Warren B. Kanders um, was on the board the year I was in the Biennial. And um, he's a war profiteer who made tear gas that was like used in Palestine and, and on the U.S.-Mexico border and all these other places that, you know, like really, really, really awful injustice and and um, it was just so st stress stressful trying to deal with like people wanted him off the board. And then also it's just like, you know, it's, I don't know, like there's a lot of galleries that get money from sketchy places and, you know, but it's like a lot of money. So I don't know, complicated issues. Yeah, it's, it's hard, you know, running crushing colonialism. I'm, I'm always looking for money to keep us going, but also, I don't want to take money from the the places that have it. It's it's a tough call because they owe us. They owe us so much. But also, I, you don't want to be beholden to them either. It's it's mm -hmm. a tightrope to walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think many of us in the arts have this grand and sometimes somewhat naive view, especially when you're early in your career that you know artistic expression can bring awareness and even solutions to the world's problems but as you mentioned in your film many of the industries responsible for these problems are funding the arts like they're making these big decisions and to some extent like who whose art is available to the world who whose voices gets to be seen you know so how do we get away from this like how do we move resources for indigenous artists and and other marginalized you know artists and creatives so that you can do this important work yeah um i mean that's another big question <laughs> um i guess really it's like i i'm like a big believer in like community-based art practices and in like you know sort of teaching emerging indigenous creatives like skills and things like that um I don't know. I guess like I come out of like sort of like a DIY, like kind of punk kind of, uh, community and sort of aesthetic. And, and I guess, I don't know. I guess there's still part of me that's like a scrappy punk that just wants these like little, you know, like, like communities like that are supporting each other and to not have to play the, the big art game with all the like money people. <laughs> um, but at the same time, like there are projects I want to do that I need a lot more money for. And I'm just lucky that like I'm here in Canada and there are some like arts councils and, and, um, telefilm and things like that to like support us. But, um, yeah, it's definitely a challenge for sure. You know, this event is taking place here in Winnipeg. Um, and, you know, in instructions, you address the large number of Native children that are taken by the government, specifically in Manitoba, mm -hmm. and, and as, you know, a money-making resource for colonizers. And you talk about choosing not to live in Winnipeg due to the fear that if you had children, they'd be taken from you simply for being Indigenous. Um, were there also concerns for you about, you know, if you had children, would you also possibly lose them for being openly you know, to us LGBTQIA or, you know, diagnosed with bipolar disorder? Yeah, I'm not so worried about the, like, being queer part, I think, because, like, I haven't heard a lot of cases um, in more recent times about people losing their kids for that reason in Canada. Um, not to say it doesn't happen, but I, I haven't heard too much about that. But, like, the bipolar thing, like, it does worry me because, um, because, th like, that is a reason people would say that, you know, your kids are in danger or something, especially if you're like having an episode and you have to go to the hospital. And, and I talk about that a little bit in the film, like if you have to go to the hospital and then like you, it, like say I didn't have somebody to look after my kids, then they, they might go into care and, and they do like do care temporarily in certain cases, but that doesn't mean you'll get them back. Um, so it's, yeah, definitely difficult. Um, yeah. And, and I think also like, um, poverty has also been like a reason that pe people's kids get taken into care. I mean, all, there's, there's like a whole bunch of, I mean, sometimes there's not even a good reason and people, you know, go to child and family services and try to like, you know, be like, what can I do? And there's really not 
like they'll prove that they're not on drugs or anything and they still won't get their kids back so it's just it's really yeah it's really awful yeah that's different different government but similar issues in the u.s like disabled people still openly queer people um you know have their children taken from them all the time native people you know so when i myself was thinking when i was younger do i want to have kids or not those were things i thought about like you know i couldn't physically have one so it was like would anyone allow me to adopt or foster and the answer is no Mm -hmm. yeah, and so yeah seeing watching you talk about that it it really struck a chord with me like you know indigenous people don't have reproductive justice like we don't have the same accesses to to the resources that that are ours to begin with and we're not allowed to i guess to exercise our rights to be full humans to have children to not have children to to live where we want to live you know Mm -hmm. wow. yeah and like um what is it called non-insured health benefits for like indigenous people in canada like they'll pay for like all the like you know contraception you want but like when i was doing fertility treatments they would not pay for any of the medications and those were like really expensive medications but yeah and you know you just think like reconciliation of course you should pay to like make more indigenous children but no <laughs> not going to yeah yeah no we we don't want the more we don't want more natives no we gotta yeah. get rid of them <laughs> yeah. um so you know this event like we are really focusing heavily on our two-spirit and other queer relatives but a lot of what people are talking about today and some of the things they're working on are you know they themselves have been put in some kind of colonial so-called care system whether it's residential schools or child protective services and and a lot of the folks here today also work on the issues of like our murdered and missing relatives. Um, do you see connections between that like resource extraction of our native children as well as just our people in general? And, and specifically, what do you feel like that looks like in say Winnipeg versus other parts of Canada since you're from different areas and have kind of lived in a few different spots? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's all. I mean, it's like kind of like this long range plan to just disappear us all. I think like, like if, um, kids are taken away from their families and they lose access to like their traditions and sort of like, um, their, and sometimes their territory and, you know, like, and their community. And, um, it's a, it's a long struggle for them to like find their way back to, um, the people that they belong to. And, um, yeah. And what was the other part of your question? <laughs> um just what kind of connections you maybe see if at all between that like extraction of our children and being taken away um and just our murdered and missing relatives in general and you know you've lived in all the kind of different places in canada and wanted to live in winnipeg and you know just as and as somebody who's not from so-called canada i'm kind of curious like how does it look different across the country you know, considering these issues. Yeah, I mean, th there's definitely like issues going on in Winnipeg right now, especially with like um, the police refusing to search the landfill. And it's so obviously a decision that was based on the fact that the the women whose bodies they think are in the landfill are indigenous. And um, yeah, a lot of really like, I mean, people know where the government's priorities lie and it's not with indigenous people. Um, and when their priorities are with indigenous people it's more about like getting access to the resources that are on our lands and like kind of dispossessing us of our lands and things like that um yeah i mean i don't know it's, it's such a big thing <laughs> it's like colonization and um homicide and um and land theft and i don't know i mean I don't know if it is different like across Canada. Like I know there's very like some very specific concerns going on in Manitoba right now. Um, but at the same time, there's like racism like all across Canada, um, in most territories. And like I, I also made a a short uh video recently about racism in Saskatchewan and a lot of the stories that I was getting told by my interviewees were like the same kinds of like you know violence and just all the all the awful things that come with colonization and being like 
mostly indigenous women that I was interviewing, like their sort of their experiences of of that kind of like misogynist racism in Saskatchewan. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it, you know, in the US it's well, some states are better than others, but they're all pretty terrible, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So switching gears just a little bit, um, so what advice do you have for indigenous people, especially our two spirit and other queer relatives who want to get into filmmaking? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess there's like a lot of like film festivals and sort of like artist run centers in Canada that, um, have programs for sort of like emerging artists to like make a film or like learn to make a video. I mean, you can also like apply to film school, but I think like community based learning is also really key, especially maybe for people who don't feel so confident with the education system and want to like experience more like hands-on like um learning um that's kind of how i started like with workshops and um and i was going to video in a lot in vancouver which was like a video production artist run center so and there's like artist run centers like that all across canada um I think also like there's community groups that like bring in artists to like teach video making skills to their their youth. I think that's always a good good way to get into it. Um yeah. Yeah, very into the workshop thing. <laughs> and then also there's just like, you know, if you're learning editing, like you can do a lot of that with like YouTube tutorials and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, it definitely feels a little easier to get into some of the different creative practices outside of having to go, you know, to undergrad and grad school and mm -hmm. all of those things, you know, the, the, the routes that often cost a lot of money and take a fair amount of privilege. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so where is the best place for, for folks to find your films and your work? Yeah, I mean, the best place would be V-Tape, which is a distributor in Toronto. And um, if you're like looking a program, they will usually give you like a password to look at stuff. Um, if you're just wanting to see like some of the things I've made without like signing up to, to V-Tape, then you can also find them on Vimeo. It's I think it's Vimeo.com slash Thursa Cut End, which is my dead name, but Vimeo won't let me change it for some reason. Um, yeah, or you can Google TJ Cuthand in Vimeo and I think they will find it. Um, also, like probably the best place for like my writing would be tjcuthand.com, which is my blog that I um, kind of overshare on and, uh, and also like post links to like projects I'm working on and stuff. All right. Well, do you have any any projects coming out you'd like to share with us? Um, I guess I also have this short on Crave right now, which is only for Canadians, but, um, it's called Quesco Seu, She Whistles, and it's, um, it's a short version of a feature film that I'm working on, so we're hoping to shoot it next year, and, um, what else am I working on? Oh, yeah, and I'm just finishing a video game called Carmilla the Lonely, which I'm hoping to get online this, uh, fall, so you can follow my website for news about that. All right. Wonderful. Well, is there anything else you want to share with us? Um, I think that's everything. Just, um, I don't know. Uh, I think Indigenous women and girls and two spirits should know that they're loved. And, um, yeah, <laughs> that's about it. All right. Well, thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to do this Q and A and for letting us show your film. Oh, sure. Yeah. Anytime. All right. Upcoming now, I'm going to call on one of our youngest warriors that has taken upon herself to be the biggest voice I have heard in a long time. And she has lit my fire to come back and step back into community to be with all of you here tonight. And I would like to introduce you to Cambria Harris. Buju, Ani, Tanse. My name is Cambria Harris, otherwise known as West Flying Sparrow Woman. I am a member of Long Plain First Nation. 
and I am here today to talk about the overall events of what's been going down in my fight for justice for my mother, Morgan Harris. I kind of prepared a speech, but I am speaking from the heart. So, Morgan Harris, my mother, Mercedes Myron, Rebecca Conswa, Buffalo Woman, otherwise known as Moshkane Bijike Ikwe. These are four women who were targeted for simply being indigenous. A known supremacist took advantage of their vulnerability and proceeded to murder them and dump their remains like garbage. Rebecca Contois' partial remains were discovered in a garbage bin back in May 2022. In June of 2022, more of Rebecca Contois' remains were discovered within the Brady landfill. Police only knew of the one murder at that time and formally charged the monster responsible with first degree murder. May 1st, 2022, my mother Morgan Harris was reported missing. My family and I immediately started scoping out the streets for my mother checking out known encampments along the river, underneath bridges, and all we found was women's clothing and bits and pieces of my mother's personality scattered amongst the people that she loved. Everyone knew her on those streets. On one of those searches, we were also looking for a woman at the same time as my mother, and that other woman's name was Mercedes Byron. I was too locked up in my own fear and grief for my mother to realize that this was not a coincidence. In June of 2022, Police get notified that there may be remains within a privately owned landfill. In July of 2022, all operations finally get halted and the cell is clapped and closed off. But the city continues to dump garbage in surrounding areas on known burial grounds. Police failed my mother. They did not disclose this information to the public. After learning that it was two women's remains dumped there within that landfill, and they decided to secretly conduct a feasibility study with a decision not to search for remains they already knew were there. September of 2022, Winnipeg Police Homicide Unit take my blood for the National Missing Persons Database. That in itself was ringing alarms in my head. By December 1st, 2022, Winnipeg Police Unit tell me my mother had fallen victim to a homicide as well as three other women. They only told me that it was done by the same man who murdered Rebecca Contois a few months previously. I already had that gut feeling back in May when they made the announcement and I just had high hopes that maybe, just maybe we would find my mother, Morgan Harris, who utilized this spot as a resource, as well as all of these other shelters in the surrounding areas. My mother, Morgan Harris, was a vulnerable Indigenous woman on the streets after having all of her children ripped, ripped away from her at a very young age. I was only six years old. My house was raided. I returned to my house coming home from a sleepover to my house surrounded by garbage bags and police. And that was one of the very last times that I saw my mom. They didn't even let me say goodbye. So, December 1st, the same night that I found out that my mother, Morgan Harris, was murdered, I took my pleas right outside the serial killer's house, where my mother's life and Mercedes and Rebecca and Moshkade Bishke Ikwe, who still remains unidentified to this day, where their lives were stolen. December 5th, 2022, Winnipeg Police Service met my family and I at the airport and told my family that they would not search the landfill, all the while showing graphic photos of the landfill sites, trying to defend their decision by chalking it up to being not feasible and too large to search. 
They use the overall acreage of the landfill to defend their decisions and not the size of the cell their remains are in itself. December 6th, I took my call to find my mother's remains to Ottawa, where I was able to attend a press conference and voice my mother's story after catching the attention of Prime Minister Trudeau, who my family met with briefly. The only thing he could say was that the government was going to do everything they could which is something that I've been told repeatedly over and over again by different politicians and levels of government, words of affirmation with no further actions. And it's disheartening and it's quite frankly disgusting to take advantage of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls' families in such a vulnerable situation. Trudeau has not reached out to my family since. December 13th, 2022. After returning home from Ottawa, we decided to do three initial days of blockades at the Brady Landfill because we believe that Buffalo Woman is in there and possibly my mother and Mercedes. December 18th, after returning home, my family and I, along with First Nations Indigenous warriors, decided to set up a permanent encampment called Camp Oregon. It's a memorial encampment for my mother because she was homeless and we're providing her that home in the afterlife because she doesn't have that closure and my mother is currently lost between this world and the spirit world because she hasn't been properly buried with a proper ceremony and my mother is a sacred human being as are all our women. In October of 2012, an Indigenous woman named Tanya Nipanak was searched for in the Brady landfill for only six days. Six days is a great injustice to the long life this woman should have lived, but instead it was cut short, not only by the hands of a monster, but by the hands of a government. With this decision being made, it set a precedent that they will not look for Indigenous people, and that many, many more Indigenous people and non-Indigenous could very well be within those landfills. This dump has been open since 1973. And it's known that GPS tracking wasn't made available until recently. So how many more bodies are lying within those landfills? The situation with Tani Nipanak is in stark comparison to a white man. They searched for a Toronto landfill for eight months straight with no hesitation. When police were asked why they would not search for my mother, they said it would be like searching for a needle in a haystack. What is the difference between the searches for a singular man in Toronto and a current search that's going on in the States right now versus four Indigenous women in Canada who were dumped like garbage? Nothing, nothing but the sheer color of their skin and the systemic cracks the government let them fall through. Statistics that this system continues to watch rise and further use against us for their own egotistical political agenda. What greater society fails to realize is Indigenous women are far more than a news story and a political tick on a politician's day. These are human beings' lives at stake, and we need to respect our sacred water carriers for the sacredness they are, as well as our men and our two-spirited who play just as a big role in this society. Indigenous people are not garbage, nor are they trash, and the fact that I have to even say these words is unfathomable. This is a genocide. So here's a poem I wrote. And this one might be triggering. I was only six years old when he took advantage of my innocence and told me not to tell my parents because I'd get in trouble. I was 11 when my mother couldn't pay the cab. The driver locked the doors on us and my mom kicked the door open. All she said was tuck, drop, and roll. And the next thing you know, we're rolling down Salter. That driver was going to kidnap us. I was 13 when Tina Fontaine, a 15-year-old girl's body, was pulled from the river. She was failed by the system I was stuck in as a child. And that instilled the fear in me that I wasn't safe, and it was true. Just yesterday, I helped host a rally with Tina Fontaine's brother on the anniversary of her passing, who spoke about the injustices she faced, how they failed her, and how those same injustices were passed down to him through the child welfare system, forced to be homeless by systems that were meant to protect your safety. I was in that same system and failed by them. 
I was 14 when I ran away from my foster home, but the men down the street in Mercedes Benz asking me for sexual favors scared me. I was 15 when I was in my first toxic relationship. His, bro his father brought indigenous girls day in and day out of his apartment. He was a sex trafficker. He used to look at me and tell me, but Cam, you are so beautiful for an indigenous woman. I was lucky not to fall victim. I was 16 when I tried to end my life for all the things I, for all the things that I faced and for all the things I went through. And I was too scared to speak up due to fear. And so because of that, I tried ending my life. I was 21 when I was seriously assaulted and left for dead by someone who claimed to care for me. I was 21 when I found out my mother, Morgan Harris, was murdered by someone who targeted indigenous women. That man also murdered Mercedes Myron, Rebecca Contois, and Buffalo woman who still remains unidentified today. He treated them like trash, and they were discarded like trash, where two women remain to lay in landfills today. I was 22 when I started to call out the, su su the supremacy and hatred I was facing in my inbox every day by men who wanted to target me and treat me like garbage just as they had my mother. I am 22 and I am a survivor and I will not stay silent. Thank you. I have to share, as I step back into community, that this powerful voice right here is speaking the words that we've spoken before. So we must come together. We must stand together, no matter what our differences are. But we also have to work together and be humble enough to do that work. And she has shown me there's strength within us that no one can see, but it's there. And we're taking it all back, starting tonight as the world watches us speak our truths from the heart of Turtle Island. So with that, my warrior, my Ogichi Takwe, we offer you gifts from our hearts. May wet from your words, your constant and fierceness to bring justice for our audience. May wet. <laughs> So as our beautiful Ogichita spoke, um, yeah, sorry, I had to put the paper down, I can't do that. That's not who I am. As that beautiful Ogichita spoke her truth, we have another relative sitting with us who I've walked with for many, many moons. Before the inquiry, during the inquiry, and to today. And I want to introduce you to Sue Caribou and her partner who continue to advocate for their relative. Again, like our young warriors spoke, who they only searched for for six days. So I'd like you to welcome Sue Caribou and their partner. Good evening. Good evening. Um, it's always, uh, it, it gets harder for me to talk about all my loved ones because the police and the whole system has failed my family so many times. I'm a day school survivor, a resident survivor, and 
When my parents were both murdered, I was in foster homes, foster homes, group homes. And I said, I want to be out of this system one day in my life. And I want my family to get justice. I have so many in my family that were murdered and two still missing to this day. And I still advocate for my family. It has taken a toll, my health. I had two surgeries. I've been advocating since 2011. I realized that when Tanya went missing, my beautiful niece, I said, I think it's time I talk about my other family that were murdered and didn't get justice. My grandfather was murdered and no one came forward. He was murdered in Mid Lake. Both my parents were murdered. The guy got eight years good behavior. And my brother Lanny, he was a two-spirit. He was murdered. My sister, Carol, was found here in Winnipeg. And they said they fro she froze to death, but the autopsy said she didn't freeze to death. She, she was all drugged up from wherever party they were at. And right now, there's only two witnesses that are alive that witnessed my sister getting drugged and raped and beaten and thrown down the street and they considered that her froze to death. They didn't even investigate. And then I have my eight-year-old niece that was also murdered. We asked so many times for help that there was something wrong with my relative and he needed to get psychiatry help. He wasn't himself. He was pulling his own hair and running to the bushes. And then my dog, my uh, Sister-in-law sent my eight-year-old niece downstairs to get the quilt, mosquito quilt. And Kyle was downstairs, uh, the oldest, oldest uh, sibling. He has mental issues and nobody believes my late brother that his son had mental issues and nobody would help my late brother until that tragedy happened with my eight-year-old niece got murdered and My beautiful niece, Tanya Pinak here. She made me realize how many, fam how many families we had that were murdered and no justice. Nobody charged for all the murders in my family. The guy that murdered both my family, that was a joke, eight years. 
So there's no justice. They promised my family to dig for my beautiful niece, Tanya, for 31 days. And they did it six days. And we were celebrating Tanya's birthday when they told us that they're not searching anymore. And the birthday party was so done. Everybody was shocked. It's only been six days and they were already giving up on her. And now they're saying they can't search for our loved ones at these landfills. I have proof that they dug at the Brady landfill for six days, and they say they can't dig Brady landfill or any landfills. Well, I can show them the proof that it couldn't be done. They just don't think much of our people. They really want our loved ones not to be found at these great landfills. I'm a residential survivor and I just got back from my residential school I used to go to. And they found on my grave 241 plus, and they're still not done, the search. And many of times, when a student went missing from residential school, they would say they sent them home. But really, did they really send them home? Why are there so many unmarked graves on all the residential schools? And now, all these landfills, now they're using the landfills to dump our loved ones. They think our loved ones are trash. Our loved ones are not trash. Nobody belongs in the dump. No human being belongs in the dump. And they insulted me by offering me a monument at the Brady Landfill. Like who wants a monument at the Brady Landfill? They, they know she's there. They dug six days, and they didn't want to continue, so what do they do? They offer us a monument to go visit her there. So in other words, they know she's there, but they don't want to continue the search. So they thought they would shut my, my mouth by giving me monument, and I sat with the inquiry, and that was a joke. None of the inquiry staff had a missing or murdered loved ones, and some didn't even understand English or spoke any English. These are the inquiry staff that are supposed to be listening to our stories about our loved ones and then help us bring our loved ones home, but they don't have a clue how we feel. They haven't been through missing our murder and they were getting Grants and grants, fancy hotels. I was scared in Toronto. Nobody 
picked me up in Toronto and the inquiry said they would be there to pick me up. And when I got there, nobody was there. And I had not ever been to Toronto. I was terrified. I didn't know where to go. So they told me, well, who asked one of our boots there? We left you a taxi slip. I said, oh my God. I was, I felt lost in a huge city. And like, a, I had two living rooms, two big, like I'm by myself. And they pay so much for the hotels and the meals and the traveling and giving us family what they call an honorary pay. I call it a hush-hush money. That's what I call the inquiry when they offer. <coughs> We've always been trying to be given a hush-hush money. Most of our families that have a loved one missing or murdered, or children are in care and they're being abused, it's still a hush-hush. We're still, they're still trying to get us to hush hush about everything and throw us money. And all the residential money, day school money, they, they rushed it out so our own people can kill each other. Government know, knows what they're doing. And yet when we ask them for help, they, 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 well, I don't know if that could be done. I don't know if it's possible. Yeah. Everything's possible. Now, we want action for our loved ones. I guarantee all these landfills, that's where they bury our loved ones. And they call them trash and leave them at the dump. What if it's one of their loved ones? They would be there 24 7 digging and digging and digging and using millions of dollars. I'm willing to go dig up the Brady landfill for my loved one. Yeah. <laughs> and I ain't giving up on any of my loved ones. I will do the digging if it comes down to that. I guarantee you that. And thank you for listening. And there is still no justice for our people. So, all they do is try to give you hush hush money. Don't ever take that hush hush money, because they will use it against you. Thank you for coming here and listening to our stories. And I'm going to keep advocating. And I'm going to go dig if I have to dig. Thank you. The, all the landfills need to be served. So we just want to thank Sue and her support, her partner, for coming in and sharing a little bit about And I, and you know, that was only a little bit about their journey here on what we call it to Mother Earth. So in honor of you sharing with us, we have this small gift to pass. 
So many blackers. You need blackers. Um, but I, I have the video of the shirt. They didn't use heavy machinery. They used rakes just to pick up the top of the papers and toss them to the side. I have, I, I recorded them. Like I wanted evidence that they were doing something. And the only thing they were doing up there was the raking. They weren't digging, they were raking. So, digging is something else. They were only raking. There was no dig. And now we want them to dig and we'll do it if they don't. Yeah. And that's the end of it. Right? Miigwech for your words. Thank you for being here. And we're going to move on with our evening. We've got a couple more speakers and a dancer, a closing prayer. So thank you again, Sue. So to change it up just a little, I, I'm going to, um, because I know, Gail, you've been here, you, uh, I'm so grateful that you've had your hair done and you've come with that healing dress to honor our relatives. So if I could introduce you to Gail Pruden, our two-spirit jingle dress dancer, and again, sorry, my little drum group will do a song so that Gail can do uh, a dance for us as this is pretty heavy stuff. Yep. So, but first, Gail's going to just share a little bit about their journey and what the dance will be about. So, Migrash. Okay. Can you make my country home of the first of them? They have a big class. I'm checking it, it's an Akuma and Nisa on it, Omaha, and Paramus at Long. No way to science with them, Kayo, Kawaka, and Gitor. Maybe you can have my children of the blue poison, which is a guy in Gitor. Maybe you get up it away, get a taco. Kayo, we car. で、so with that, I'll introduce myself in English. I speak Ojibwe and I'm fluent. And this is the way I like starting off speaking my language. And I was gifted this feather and I find the strength to speak my truth through this feather. Sometimes I forget it, I baffle, but that's okay. As I, when you speak from the heart, it's easy for you to say what it is you need to say. And what I was saying while I was speaking the language was that how 
I'm the oldest of five. I knew we were brought up out in the reservation where we had beautiful water in front of us and a beautiful forest behind us. And back then, there was no close by housing. Everybody was so far apart. And we were brought up with all the stuff of all our jobs, you know, they were around our reservation. That's something that we never seen. So, there are three things my grandmother always, always told us as children. Made no sense when we were kids, what she used to say to us on reservation. The first thing she would say, Don't ever lose this language created gift to us. And the second thing she would tell us was, Don't ever be ashamed of how you look. And then the third thing she would say was like, how, um, uh, they we got, or they we got, or they we got, or they we which means when you're walking with people, be gentle with the people around you. And these were like the three things that she was building her head. And to this day, I carry that and I always tell people, it's a beautiful, a beautiful way to live your life. But it's very sad to know that this language was taken away from so many which shouldn't have never happened. It wasn't there to be long as it was created either language. But for the speakers, when you hear a speaker speaking their language, you feel it from here because you're Anishinaabe yourself and this language also belongs to you whether you understand it or not. <clears throat> and that's why I often like starting in my language, because it's something that I will never, I will never lose. You know, so how it's really, um, the other thing too, which she used to talk about was how um, uh, go music, and that to me is beautiful when she would tell us, don't forget, you're not always going to be a child. You're going to grow to as, as, as old as I am. But throughout your lifetime, you're building your nest as where you're going to lay down when your time is up. So it's up to you how you treat your people. If you're going to treat them with love, respect, beautiful ways, you're making yourself a very comfortable place to rest when your time is up. And I truly believe that. I like joking around a lot, but that's one of the gifts that we carry. It's a, it's a healing gift. We share that. It's best to laugh. Even if you have something to cry about, laugh it off. It's more healing that way. And the other thing she always told us was, don't worry yourself for nothing. <clears throat> she would always tell us, put everything in Creator's hands. And it's not easy, but it's easier than worrying. And that's just the way that she, she told us how to... It was almost like she was implanting things in her head as little children. I guess setting, set, setting her ways of what's in front of us when we get older. So it's a beautiful, beautiful way of life. And also, 
the book. When it comes to the Bible, she read the Bible. So I knew about the Bible. And she also told, told us, never make fun of anybody's religion. It's none of your business how anybody wants, how anybody wants to see created. It's up to the people themselves, the way that they want to see creator. So, we have respect for any religion, all religion, as long as, from, as, long as they're living the life, the, the, the good life, the great way. And I just want to say, Nate Wedge, for inviting me here. Thank you for having me. I showed up earlier, and I had to disappear for a while because I totally forgot that I'm supposed to be dancing in my jingle, because I have to run home. <laughs> Thank goodness I didn't get that far from here. <laughs> and then I had to... <laughs> I invited my friend that's sitting, sitting back there. I don't know if she wants me to mention her name, but... Here I was just putting her to work. <laughs> she was supposed to come and listen to what's going on here. I put her to work, but... Creator will bless her for that. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about the... Uh, Jigilukas that I wear. It was something that you had not been like that. I um, I was totally, I was totally. This is the pan that I was gifted to dance with in my jigilukas, and that's the pan. That's the feather I used to talk. When I first um, um, I used to dream about. You know, I knew that was me from behind in the stream that I had. It was a recurring dream over and over and over again. Where it seemed like I could see the back of myself standing. There's a silhouette, but on the other side, there's something going on. I couldn't see all the time. I couldn't see. So when I went and talked to a knowledge holder, she was just happy telling me, creators get the new address. And I said, there's absolutely no way Creators get to me no dress. I said, because I have too much respect for women, I will never ever wear a jingle dress I told her. So she says, well, it's up to you. Creator does not make mistakes. I didn't listen. But that was the wrong thing to do. Because she, she told me, either creators, creator will let you know that when he's gifting you something, you take it. And I got really sick of my own stuff. And she warned me that either your family or you are going to get sick. And I got really sick. So that's when I said, okay, I have to give in, get this to you. And it's funny how, um, because I didn't know anything about jingle presses, but I had a lot of problems and I used to stay far away because I felt like I was too dirty to go into the arbor. I felt I didn't belong because I'm too spirited. And that is what I am. I am a too spirited cookum and I'm proud to say it. So, um, when I uh, didn't know anything about a jingle press and I turned to a friend, Albert Papal, to help me with this dress. So he said, go buy the fabric. Buy everything that we need. So he gave me a list I would have shopping. And when I went and seen him, I bought a whole big roll just lugging it. And then he laughed at me. You're making a jingle dress, not a teepee. You didn't tell me how much fabric to buy it. <laughs> so it took me forever to get him this fabric. And I wanted to buy fabric so nobody can copy my dress, because I didn't know. <laughs> but it's been a journey. It's been 25 years now I've been dancing in Jingle, and I've danced everywhere across Turtle Island, Canada, the States. And it really keeps me humble, simply because I'm only a helper. Without this dress, I'm nothing, I'm nobody. It's in the dress where the healing is, and that's where the healing starts, by these jingle brushes. I'm very happy that creator gifted me one, because I use it the best I can wherever I go. When people ask and follow up for me, they plan to drop my will. And it's, it, means, it means a lot to me 
because I never once thought I'd be anything like this, that thing of power. But I was young, feeling too dirty and those not even to go there. This, this armor is for all of us. It doesn't matter what you think of. It's there, it's there to heal, find your healing. And this jingle dress, when you hear the jingles go, it invites in the grandmothers and the grandfathers. This is how the healing starts taking place. It doesn't just come for any other regalia that you see. It's inviting in our ancestors. You could feel them when you're dancing. You could feel them right around your hair and down there, your feet. Even the ground, sometimes I feel it moving. And I just love that feeling. I've never changed my life for that. So the story behind the Jingle Dress, I'll share a little bit about. I was invited out to White Chris Bay, because that's where the dress originates from. And um, all Jingle Dress dancers were invited, not just myself. So I went, and then in that ceremony, there's a different dance to do. I, I can't do. I tried so many times, I just can't pick it up. But because how it is a grandfather who would ask creator what to do to save her granddaughter that was dying beside him and asked, what can I do to save my granddaughter? This is when he put tobacco under his pillow or whatever they used back then and asked creator Give me a sign, how can I save my granddaughter? And this is when the dream came to him about these dresses, these four dresses. And there's lots and tons of other stories across like the States and Canada. But this is the one I like. I believe in this one. That oh, the four dresses that they had to make told his wife about it. There was the wife got out asked the community woman to come and help her make these four dresses. And they used these snuff cans, Copenhagen. I guess everybody was a snuffer back then, I don't know. But they, <laughs> that's what they used to these Copenhagen. And they made three rooms in the bottom and one across the top. And so when the dresses were made, he asked her, now the dresses are made, now what do we do? So again, he asked Peter, the dresses are me, what do we do now? So it was Peter who taught his grandfather the, the dance. And he's the one who showed these jingle breasts that the dress dancers how to dance. So it was a man who first danced in front of this jingle dress. And I never hear that anywhere else, except there. It was in that ceremony, you know, like something like this where I did that. So it's different everywhere. And even at that ceremony, there was two men that went down saying, they know those steps. I, 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 I give up. Maybe one day I will get it, but I don't know. <laughs> but it was so beautiful to watch that. I was just so overwhelmed, I was so healed, I was so touched by going to that ceremony and watching that. But with that, with the teaching these women how to dance, they picked up this granddaughter and took her to the sacred fire and there was a grandfather drum there. And then that's when the grandfather drum started going. These women started dancing. And this was in a matter of four days dancing. On the fourth days when this little girl finally got up and danced behind the single verse and that's where the healing took place. This is why these dresses are sacred to us. And especially when it comes to, I often pray these women be found that have gone missing. There's no reason for that. Why? And these are the ones that, they're the reasons why we're here, because these are the water camps. With the upbringing that I have, having so much respect for women, it really rips my heart out to every time I hear somebody's missing. Or somebody got murdered. But that's got to stop. It really has to stop. Enough is enough.
So I'm gonna dance this dance. Um, I just bought this song. Um, red jingle dress. I kind of injured my left ankle, but with a healing dress, I can do it because I know I need to heal myself also. And that's the reason why I like dancing this red jingle dress because I pray and pray hard, as hard as I can to creator asking the people that are doing this. We need to pray for them because that's how we were all brought up. Not to carry anger or hurt, but pray for the people that are doing this. It's not easy. I know it's not easy. I don't want to lose a real ass if I don't care. So. <laughs> So I don't do it. I don't want to take. I don't want to take too much of your time. Time, she didn't tell me how much time I had, but I'll, I'll do a little dress. Here you go, beautiful sir.
was Sorry Eagle, and our dancer was Gail Pruden, and uh, I just, I have no words. What a beautiful moment. Um, yeah, I'm so grateful for this opportunity, for the world, and for those watching, if you're still watching, to see how we come together as community and share our gifts with each other. So, as you see, they're all hugging that dancer, Gail, for that healing dress, that dance that she just gave and shared with all of us. And those drummers singing that song. You know, it's important that we thank them also for their gifts that they're sharing. And so, Gail, Gail, can I just have you for a second? We just want to pass you some stuff. And I want to pass you this event from us, Miigwech. And when you're done coming off, I want you to go see my, my sister Jane over there. She's got a gift for you. Miigwech for your dance. She just said it, but that was power. Power in here. That's who we are. So now we're going to move on just a little and uh, we're going to fix the camera angle. And I am now bringing up uh, a sister from Victoria, BC, who is on a journey from coast to coast, from the east, west to the east, to go reunite with her family also. But most importantly, outside of reuniting with her family, she is advocating for our families. She is doing a tour from coast to coast for MMIP awareness, and she is an advocate. And now I'd like to introduce you to Monique May. I was stacking the building between the two ones, the brown ones. All right. Excuse my voice. I think I lost an hour part of that. Um, I will do my best to get through this. First of all, I would like to humbly thank everyone here, and it is my privilege to be here in your territory. I am Mi'kmaq Acadian, English language Portuguese. Lost my talk. The talk you took away. When I was a little girl at Chicago School, you snatched it away. I speak like you. I feel it like you. I create like you. The script, the scrambled ballad about my words. Two ways I talk, both ways I say, your way is more powerful. So gently, I offer my hand and ask, let me find my talk. That poem was written by Mi'kmaq poet Laurier. And those words mean a lot to me. I first became very involved with MMIP while living in the Northwest Territories. But while I was there, I unfortunately became very ill and was diagnosed with a rare disease. I spent much time in hospital, too many time, too much time in hospital. And then, when I was happened here in Winnipeg, shut up to my core, I knew I had to find my talk, my voice, to amplify your voice. Colonialism, systemic racism, equal genocide in our country. And it's alive and it's well. But look around this room. We become stronger and stronger every day. I look to our youth and I see strength. I look to our cookies and our elders and I see strength, and I see healing. 
With that, I wish each and every one of you the best as I travel across Canada. I try to bring awareness to the 231 calls for justice, which are not implemented. Two out of 231 with no accountability from any level of government. And many of our calls don't cost money. They cost restructuring, putting Indigenous people in positions where their voice can be heard. With that, I leave you all blessings, respect, much love. So we have one more quick speaker, another community member. But first and foremost, when you come, thank you for coming all the way to participate with us. A little gift from our heart into your heart. And we hope to see you when you travel back. I know we will. And now I'd like to introduce you to Mary Black, another wonderful, amazing, uplifting community spirit that has gone through so much and is an advocate. I remember this one when she was just this big. And she, now, she's, now she's got babies and she's all grown up and I'm inspired every time I see her on, on social media at the work that she does within our community. So Mary Black. Miigwech. 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 I'm known um, by Great Spirit Kishimanto as Blue Thunderbird Sky. My first name is uh, Mary Black. But I'm going to give you one message, and I'm going to give you one message tonight because I only have two minutes to talk here. So my message to you is brothers and sisters across Turtle Island and across our sacred nation. Our time has come. When we come together, we are so incredibly powerful. We create change. We create movements. When you use your voice. When you go home tonight, don't let this be the end. Use your voice. Contact, let everybody know. Let your neighbors know. Your coworkers know. Use your voices. That is medicine. That is power. Gifted to us by creating. That's medicine. If we come together, we let everybody know what atrocities that Canada has committed against our people, against our babies, our sisters, our mothers, and that they are loved and they will not be forgotten. If we keep fighting for them, fighting for them, fighting for them, we will have change. And I guarantee you, when they go into that land, there's battles, they dig them up, they're going to find a lot more than those three women. I promise you that. So do not give up your fight. Sometimes it feels hopeless, like nobody's listening, but you never forget how powerful we are. When we are united, we are working genocide. We can overcome anything. We wish. And so with that, another big match. Some tobacco, some cereal for you can play. And of course, a gift from our heart to yours. I'm so grateful that you came tonight, Miigwech. And now we're going to have our closing prayer by Charlotte. And uh, I really want to thank everybody for coming, participating. It's been such a pleasure. I love you all, all those that I know in the room, and even those I don't know. I am so grateful. I am so honored and humbled that you all come to participate. So big witch again, and let's be respectful as we have this closing prayer, please, and thank you. In last continue. Ah, that's how we got to say my too. For this beautiful evening with our relatives. Can I ask them to Coco Mel and Mosu Mel for the words that we shared with one another? Can I ask them to keep an hour sleep for the food that we were blessed with and the medicines? Can I ask the Creator, grandmothers, grandfathers, be with my relatives as they travel home to their home fires. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy. 
and no creator grandmothers grandfathers that we won't give up the fight for our loved ones and we will keep on fighting for them if i forgot anything creator please accept them in my song prayers Again, I just want to honor you. Um, again, my message I sent you. When you speak the language, it gets me in a place I've never been in before. So, from my place to yours, in English. And that pretty much concludes our evening relatives. Again, I want to lift my hands to Sorry Needle. That was powerful. Me, Wretch, Me, Wretch, Me, Wretch. To all my relations and relatives in this room, walk as gently as you can. Mother Earth has taken so much. It's our turn to walk gently. Much love, Me, Wretch. Have a good night.